In the last video, we examined the pessimistic induction argument against realism. Uh, this is one of two main arguments that anti-realists have deployed. The other is the underdetermination argument. Uh, so just to clarify, uh, what scientific anti-realism claims is that we do not have knowledge of unobservables. We shouldn't believe what science tells us about electrons, photons, black holes, mitochondria and so on. Science is very useful and important and it has many roles to play in society, but it, it doesn't arrive at the truth about the unobservable world. Uh, instead, the point of science is, is simply to capture the facts about the observable phenomena. So, the underdetermination argument begins with the claim that various different theories are consistent with the available evidence. Uh, or in other words, different theories are empirically equivalent with accepted theory. Two theories are empirically equivalent if they entail the same predictions uh, or, or they entail the same things about how the observable world will behave. So the idea is that if we take some theory we currently accept, so, uh, so say some theory in quantum mechanics, then there will be some there will be another theory that is empirically equivalent. So it, it makes uh, the same same claims about observables, but that makes different claims about unobservables. Our choice of theory is therefore uh, underdetermined by the data. The data do not determine a specific theory. As an analogy, suppose we have a graph and we are making points on the graph uh, and these points uh, are, are, are represent some underlying line. Uh, now suppose we can discover the values only for whole numbers on the, uh, the x and y axes. So, so suppose we have a series of points like this. Uh, now, the thing is, we can draw all sorts of different lines consistent with these points. We might draw a straight line, that seems the obvious one, but we might also have a line like this. Uh, and no matter how many whole numbered points we add to the graph, uh, there will always be an infinite number of different lines consistent with them. Uh, so, uh, the, the point is, the points underdetermine the line. And in this analogy, the, the, the values for whole numbers are the observable phenomena, whereas the values for numbers in between the whole numbers are, are analogous to the unobservable phenomena. Totally different claims about the unobservable can all be compatible with what we know about observables, or so the argument goes. Let's take a specific example. Uh, this is from Baz van Frassen. Consider Newtonian mechanics. In Newtonian mechanics, if you are travelling in a straight line at a constant speed, this is indistinguishable from being at rest. Or in other words, any experiments you perform will have the same result as if you were at rest. One consequence of this is that in the Newtonian cosmology, there's no way to distinguish by empirical testing whether the entire universe is at rest or the entire universe is moving in a given direction in constant motion. Uh, so Newtonian cosmology plus static universe makes exactly the same predictions as Newtonian cosmology plus moving, moving universe. As beings within the universe, there's simply no way for us to detect one way or another which is the case. There's no evidence that can decide between these two theories. Uh, of course, we know that Newtonian mechanics is not the correct cosmology, but this uh, just is an example of how theories can make different claims but be empirically equivalent. So the argument against realism should be fairly obvious. Um, any accepted theory has rivals that are different but empirically equivalent. The anti-realist uh, next assumes that if theories are empirically equivalent, then they are equally well supported by the evidence. And the conclusion is that the choice between uh, the accepted theory and the rival theory is arbitrary. We shouldn't believe in the truth of accepted theories because there are other theories that are equally well supported. Uh, the only reason why the realist endorses the theory she does is because these happened to have been developed first. Science could have developed in other ways. Our accepted theory postulates electrons, but there are other theories equally compatible with the evidence that don't postulate electrons, so we shouldn't believe that electrons are real. To lay it out uh, more formally, we have two premises. Premise 1, any accepted theory has rivals that are empirically equivalent. Premise 2, empirical evidence is the only constraint on theory choice. It follows, conclusion number 1, that any accepted theory has rivals that are equally well supported, from which it follows uh, we should uh, not believe that accepted theories are true. So, uh, that's a pretty... Uh, 
powerful argument. It's quite quite an intuitively obvious argument, I think, um, and it's quite a challenge. How might the realist respond? Well, one question is, uh, I mean, although it's presumably true that any theory has empirically equivalent rivals, do all theories have empirically equivalent rivals of a kind that should trouble the realist? So we need to be clear about what's actually required for the anti-realist to, to use under determination as an argument against realism. So first of all, in order to pose any trouble for the realist, the rival theory needs to be significantly different from the currently accepted theory. It needs to be different enough that if the rival theory were true, the currently accepted theory would not even be approximately true. Because remember, the realist doesn't claim that currently accepted theories are completely true. Indeed, she positively expects that they will be, be replaced in the future. So she, she accepts quite openly that accepted theories are underdetermined. Indeed, she thinks that there are rivals that are even more compatible with the evidence than current theories are. The realist's claim is simply that our best theories are close to the truth. So, so the rival theory needs to be significantly different. The anti-realist uh, is, is claiming, for, in, for example, that there is a theory of particle physics that differs significantly from the standard model, but that entails the same observable consequences. Uh, there's a theory that doesn't postulate electrons or muons or quarks, but is just as successful predictively. Now, the obvious question is, what does this theory look like? Um, I mean, at this point, the, the realist will, of course, challenge the defender of the underdetermination argument to uh, produce such a theory. Uh, as Michael Devitt points out, the anti-realist is forming an empirical claim. Uh, the, the claim is that uh, any theory has rivals that make very different claims, but that are equally supported by the evidence. That's a substantial empirical claim. And as such, we quite arguably need evidence in its favour. Uh, I mean, we can draw analogies like the analogy to the graph with the infinite number of compatible lines, but these kinds of uh, abstract analogies don't justify substantial empirical claims. So what is the, the evidence for the, the underdetermination thesis? Uh, basically, the challenge to the anti-realist is to produce some of these substantially different but empirically equivalent rival theories. So what, for instance, is the empirically equivalent rival to the modern synthesis in biology? Uh, in other words, the, the combination of the Darwinian tradition and evolutionary theory with Mendelian genetics. I mean, I guess the problem is it doesn't look so plausible that, that there are such rival theories. Uh, I mean, of course, there might be, but until this is actually presented, uh, the realist can ask, why should we care? Um, I mean, after all, the the attitude of, of most scientists themselves is that, you know, sure, if a, if a plausible rival theory is presented, it has, it has to be considered, but we don't care about the bare possibility of a rival theory. So um, Kyle Stanford uh, distinguishes between global and local approaches to underdetermination. The global approach uh, tries to give an algorithm for generating alternatives to any theory you might wish. So this tries to show that, in principle, there will always be rivals to accepted theories. One version of this has been suggested by Andre Kukla. Consider the theory we currently accept. Call it T. It can be any theory. Now we can say that T-O is the theory that the observable world behaves as if T were true. Uh, of course, this is uh, compatible with uh, T, among various other theories, because if T is actually true, then T-O would obviously be true as well. But T star is the theory that T-O is true and T-O is not true. So basically, T star says that the observable world behaves as if T is true, but uh, T isn't true. Clearly, T star is empirically equivalent to T. They make the same claims about observable phenomena, but it's also, by definition, incompatible with T. So T has an empirically equivalent rival. Uh, so there are two worries about this global uh, manoeuvre. First of all, it, it sort of seems like a kind of uh, uh, philosophical sleight of hand, uh, as I like to say of, of some things. I mean, clearly T star is, is strongly parasitic on T. T star is not uh, is not a genuine rival to T. 
Uh, the worry here is that in order to construct T star, we have to rely strongly on T itself. Indeed, T star is basically an abstraction from T. So it's not clear that this, this should really count as an, an actual rival theory. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what the criteria for being a proper theory are, but assuming that there are criteria, then it would seem, you know, T star is, is surely in some sense not a proper theory uh, in, in the way that T is, whatever T happens to be. Um, and obviously any, any, any similar global mechanism for generating rivals will end up being so general and abstract that it will fail to produce a, a genuine rival theory. Uh, secondly, and I think more importantly, as Stanford points out, this approach leads us straight into radical scepticism, because we can consider the theory TE, uh, which says that the observable world merely appears as if T is true, or in other words, our immediate sense impressions are as if, uh, as if there is an observable world, and they are as if theory T is right about how the observable world behaves. But maybe uh, the observable world isn't that way. Maybe there is no observable world at all. Um, so c pretty clearly, we, we, th this approach will lead us to be sceptical of observables as well as unobservables. Now, this may be an interesting debate, but it's not really the concern of, of this series. Uh, as we've said, we're, we're looking at forms of anti-realism that grant that we can have knowledge of the observable world, but that try to undermine scientific knowledge of unobservables. The, the, the interesting question, I think, for us is, are there any special problems that face scientific knowledge in particular? The problem of radical scepticism is a, a very general philosophical problem that has been with us for thousands of years. The undetermination argument is presented as a problem for scientific knowledge of unobservables, not for just knowledge in general. Um, so, uh, so Stanford suggests that, that any global strategy for generating rivals is going to amount to nothing more than, than the problem of radical scepticism, which, uh, again, it may, may be an interesting problem, but um, you know, we're, we're sort of putting that to one side uh, for this for, for this series. Or at, or at any rate, I mean, e even if you are interested in it and want to talk about it, um, the question is, is there a special problem of underdetermination with respect to uh, scientific knowledge? Uh, and the problem, of course, is that any general algorithm like this, any global algorithm, will apply equally well to uh, claims about observable phenomena. So these problems suggest turning from a global to a local approach. The local underdetermination argument simply takes a specific theory, then constructs an empirically equivalent rival to that theory. For instance, Van Frassen's example regarding Newtonian mechanics. Van Frassen shows us how to generate an empirically equivalent rival to a specific theory. Now, obviously, we can't generalize this to all theories, uh, as in the global approach. So the local approach requires a bit more work to make this underdetermination argument apply to science in general, we need to construct alternatives to various accepted theories in various fields, and then we can reason by induction that uh, all or most other theories similarly have empirically equivalent rivals. Uh, but now the main problem uh, here is, as I noted earlier, it's not clear that this can actually be done. Uh, so so as, as I said, what exactly is the empirically equivalent rival to the modern evolutionary synthesis? What is the empirically equivalent rival to the standard model? Uh, we can only inductively infer that all or most theories have empirically equivalent rivals if we have a, a good inductive base to, to work from. But so far, not even one example has, has been produced. So to be clear, it's true that some philosophers of science have produced empirically equivalent rivals. Van Frassen's example with Newtonian mechanics is one. But notice that Van Frassen simply takes the theory of Newtonian mechanics, and then adds a claim that the theory itself implies there can be no evidence for, either that the universe as a whole is at rest, or that the universe as a whole is in motion. Obviously, no sensible scientist is going to accept one or the other of these claims. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the realist uh, would be a realist about Newtonian mechanics, and then suspend judgment uh, about factual claims for which the theory implies there can be no evidence. And in any case, whichever Newtonian theory is true, whether it's Newtonian mechanics plus the universe at rest or Newtonian mechanics plus the universe in motion, the other theory would be approximately true to a very high degree. 
Van Frassen doesn't give us an example of a theory that is significantly different. There have been other examples of uh, empirically equivalent rival theories, but all of them, as far as I'm aware, suffer from the same problems. They generally go beyond what any sensible realist would believe anyway, and they're not different enough. Um, I mean, it's worth noting, I think, that Van Frassen's example is really just a standard case of an unresolved controversy in science. The Newtonian theory doesn't tell us whether the universe as a whole is at rest or in motion. Uh, similarly, if we look at theories that are accepted these days, we will be able to come up with plenty of propositions that they don't tell us anything about one way or another. That's a standard feature of science, not an argument against realism. Okay, a second objection uh, is to the underdetermination argument, is that the argument assumes that empirical support is the only kind of support that a theory can have, um, that, that, that agreement with the evidence um, or you know, entailing the right things about the observable world is the only kind of support a theory can have. That's what allows us to infer that you know, since, since there are rivals that are empirically equivalent to accepted theories, therefore there are rivals that are equally well supported as accepted theories. But is this correct? One obvious objection is to appeal to the non-empirical virtues. Uh, so the sciences often involve inference to the best explanation. In the previous videos, we discussed some of the explanatory virtues, some of the uh, properties a theory can have that, that, that might make it preferable to other theories. One explanatory virtue is predictive success, agreement with the evidence. But arguably there are others um, that aren't directly connected to empirical and predictive success. For instance, um, simplicity, uh, coherence with other beliefs, uh, unifying power or, or the ability to unify various different phenomena under a single causal explanation. Um, so the realist can argue that even if there are, that there are empirically equivalent, equivalent rivals, this doesn't entail that these rivals are uh, equally well supported um, as accepted theories. Um, so I suppose the, the immediate objection from the anti-realist point of view is, well, why should we assume that non-empirical explanatory virtues are a guide to the truth? Uh, an anti-realist would probably argue that we care about things like simplicity and unifying power for purely practical reasons. So a, a simpler theory is easier to work with. But a simpler theory isn't thereby more likely to be true. Um, I mean, af after all, a theory that postulates only electrons and no other fundamental particles is ontologically simpler than the currently accepted standard model. But the realist would say that uh, such a theory is false, whereas the standard model is true, presumably because the predictions of um, the theory that postulates only electrons uh, wouldn't match our observations nearly as well as the standard model. So ultimately, it still comes down to empirical virtue. Um, yeah, we, we may well prefer to use a uh, simpler theory than a more complex theory, but if they say the same things about observable phenomena, um, there's, there's no way to judge which is actually true. So uh, it would be uh, something of a tangent to consider the explanatory virtues in detail, but I, I do want to look at just one of them so uh, we can see how we might connect um, non-empirical virtues with truth. So let's think about simplicity. Simplicity is, is certainly used in the sciences, and actually there are cases where it does seem to be connected with the truth. Simplicity is an important part of the methods of phylogenetics, which is a study of relations of ancestry and descent between species. This is a phylogenetic tree, and it shows how current species are related to each other. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, the common ancestor of the eagle and the crow is uh, is more recent than the common ancestor of the crow and the crocodile, for instance. Um, uh, now, a basic principle for building phylogenetic trees is that the best estimate of the true evolutionary relationships is the one that postulates the fewest evolutionary changes. Um, so, suppose we say that whales are fishes. Uh, it seems an initially plausible uh, a view that whales are, are fish, they're in the sea like fish. Uh, so we say that whales are more closely related to tuna uh, than to lizards and monkeys. Now, this would require us to suppose that a number of traits that whales have in common with reptiles and 
uh, mammals each evolved twice. Uh, so a four-chambered heart, a single aortic arch, uh, feeding their, their young with milk, and so on. So all of these traits, number two to nine, uh, uh, each evolved twice on this on this tree. So you can you can see here that uh, in the we have um, the evolution of the traits leading up to the the lizards, the monkey, and hippopotamus, and then they uh, these six to nine uh, evolve on the monkey and hippopotamus line, uh, and then we have to postulate that these traits numbers two to nine these eight traits evolve again on the uh, line leading up to whales. So so we have to postulate they evolved twice. Um, on the other hand, if we treat rail, whales as most closely related to mammals, uh, all of these traits evolved just once, and only the dorsal fin, uh, has uh, we have to suppose, evolved twice. So, so this tree is far simpler in that it, it predicts far fewer evolutionary changes in the past. It, it, it assumes uh, far fewer evolutionary changes in the past. And, and this is the tree that would be accepted in, uh, in modern biology. This, we believe, is the correct tree, uh, the correct representation of the uh, ancestors of, of whales. Um, now, so why, why do we think that this is, this is true? Why should we suppose that this simpler tree is the true one? Well, uh, th there are many uh, studies here that do confirm the link with, of simplicity with truth. Just to give one example, in the study uh, Experimental Phylogenetics, Generation of a Known Phylogeny by uh, David Hills and, and colleagues, a lineage of bacteriophage, so that's a virus that infects bacteria, uh, was subjected to a mutagenic chemical that caused it to accumulate mutations and evolve very rapidly. And this resulted in eight new lineages whose evolutionary relationships were pr precisely known. Uh, then the researchers applied the method of simplicity to generate a hypothetical phylogenetic tree. And although there are only uh, there are over um, 100,000 possible trees, their method found the correct one. So uh, in this example, it, it would seem that simplicity, one of the explanatory virtues, is indeed tied to truth. However, it's not really clear that this can help the realist because the obvious problem with this kind of example is that we can't generalise the appeal to simplicity in phylogenetics to all of science and philosophy. In each field, an appeal to simplicity is only justified if it's shown empirically that it gives the right answers. Uh, you know, in other words, if appeal to simplicity uh, improves our chances of constructing a theory that agrees with observations. So ultimately, we're back to empirical virtue. And the empirical superiority of simplicity must be de demonstrated for each case. There is no general proof. I mean, notice that the appeal to simplicity in phylogenetics that we just discussed is very specific. Not just any kind of theoretical simplicity will do. It's, it's when we're looking at e constructing evolutionary trees, we build the tree that assumes the fewest evolutionary changes. That is one specific kind of simplicity in one specific field of science, and it's justified empirically because we can we can test it and show that it gives us the right answers. So I think that you know examples like this they they just don't show us that simplicity is in general tied to the truth. So uh, a second response from the realist is that some sort of empiric some sort of appeal to non-empirical virtues must work if we are to resist radical scepticism. Uh, as we noted before, if underdetermination is just a kind of radical scepticism, then it's no more worrying uh, than radical scepticism about other minds or material objects or the past or whatever. Now, since radical sceptical scenarios entail the same claims about our experiences as, as, as more common sense scenarios do, we have to appeal to non-empirical virtues if we're going to rule out radical scepticism. So consider the scenario that you know, God brought the universe into existence five minutes ago, but he set it up very precisely so that it seems to have lasted longer, so that we all have the, um, I mean, they wouldn't be memories, but, you know, we think that we have memories of, of, of a past from before five minutes ago. Well, if we're going to rule out that scenario, it looks like we'll have to appeal to non-empirical virtues. So 
why shouldn't the appeal to non-empirical virtues that is necessary to avoid sceptical scenarios also work to block the underdetermination argument with respect to unobservables? Um, it seems like we could just uh, appeal to, to the same sorts of virtues there. I think ultimately, though, the biggest problem with the appeal to non-empirical virtues is why can't we simply run the underdetermination argument in terms of all explanatory virtues? So the anti-realist can argue that any accepted theory has significantly different rivals that are both empirically equivalent and equivalent in terms of non-empirical virtues. So uh, any theory has rivals that are equally well supported. Uh, I don't really see why the anti-realist shouldn't shouldn't simply give give this argument. Um, you know that seems to be about as have about as much support as the weaker underdetermination argument. I mean, again, we, we just come back to the first realist response that the anti-realist has simply failed to substantiate her claim. Um, you know, why should the bare possibility that there might be a rival theory that is empirically equivalent and equivalent in terms of non-empirical virtues matter any more than the bare possibility that, uh, for instance, all of my experiences are, are a hallucination? Um, so, you know, that there is certainly a problem here for the anti-realist in that you know that the challenge is okay well let's let's see this theory that is equivalent in terms of empirical virtues and non-empirical virtues um but it, it just seems to me that appealing to, to non-empirical virtues is pretty futile for the realist because uh, the the underdetermination argument can just be rerun in terms of of non-empirical virtues so i'm not really sure that the, that, that this approach for the realist is really going to work. Okay, a third objection from uh, Samia Okasha appeals to the holistic nature of confirmation, or the uh, Duhem-Quine thesis from Pierre Duhem and W.V.O. Quine. Now, uh, you need to be a bit careful when you read the literature here, because many writers treat confirmation holism as being closely related to, or even identical to, the underdetermination argument. Uh, in fact, they're totally different, and Okasha argues that it's it's not clear that they're even compatible. Um, Okasha thinks that a confirmation holism actually undermines the underdetermination argument. So, what is confirmation holism? Well, it's pretty pretty simple. Um, basically, confirmation holism is the claim that theories and hypotheses are never tested in isolation. They're only tested against a whole background of theories. Um, they're only tested against a whole uh, world view. And the consequence of this is that, in principle, in the face of any potential falsifier, any proposition can be retained by simply altering the background beliefs. So let's take a specific example. Before the development of modern astronomy, it was believed that the moon uh, was a perfect sphere. In the Aristotelian cosmology, the heavens were considered to be absolutely perfect and immutable, uh, and imperfections only occurred in the, in the uh, so-called sublunary sphere, the region below the moon. So take the hypothesis, the moon is a perfect sphere. That's what we're looking to test. Now, an immediate problem is that we can see, just with the naked eye, that the moon doesn't appear perfect. It has different colours over its surface. It has these sort of blemishes on it. So that would seem to falsify a proposition. But actually, no, because there are all sorts of ways of accounting for this. We might say that, well, it's because the moon is made of a substance like marble, um, or that uh, you know, different parts of it emit light in different ways, or that uh, the apparent imperfections on the moon are merely reflections of the Earth's imperfections. So, uh, moving on a little bit, then we have Galileo who observes the moon through his telescope and who shows, using geometry, that certain small dark patches that, that seem to change night by night must be shadows of mountains. Does this falsify the proposition? Well, again, not necessarily. We might invoke the argument, uh, again, that the moon is merely reflecting imperfections of the Earth, or we might object to Galileo's telescope. We might say that, although it works fine for terrestrial phenomena, it's unreliable when it's turned to the heavens. So uh, there's no need to uh, be, be worried about his, his evidence because it's, um, you know, it's, it's spurious. And that actually was an argument that was used against Galileo by uh, defenders of the older cosmology at, at his time. 
So a few hundred years later, we send uh, people and rovers to the moon. Uh, they bring back photos and rocks and so on. And we can clearly see that the moon is not perfect. Uh, surely now our hypothesis is falsified. But again, um, perhaps we buy into the moon landing conspiracy theories that nobody has ever been to the moon, that uh, f photos of the moon are really photos of a studio set and so on. I mean, these kinds of claims are pretty implausible, but they allow us to retain the hypothesis that the moon is a perfect sphere. So the point of all of this is that it's impossible to test a hypothesis in isolation. No hypothesis in itself entails anything about how the observable world will behave. We can only derive predictions from a hypothesis by adding all sorts of background assumptions. And this means uh, that whenever a, a test of a hypothesis yields an unpredicted result, we can alter our belief in the hypothesis or we can alter our belief in one of the background assumptions. Uh, every piece of evidence is therefore a, a test of our whole web of belief in, in Quine's terms. Uh, this is confirmation holism. Now, there are different forms of confirmation holism, some stronger than others, but I think that some sort of confirmation holism is fairly obviously true. Um, uh, any hypothesis, any theory, depends on a substantial chunk of background theory. Uh, now, you know, as I say, there are different ways to spell this out, but uh, it has two consequences for the underdetermination argument. First of all, Confirmation holism entails that there isn't some uh, clear set of observable consequences of a theory. The notion that some rival theory will make the same predictions about observable phenomena is therefore undermined, because it depends entirely on the background assumptions. Different background assumptions lead to different predictions about observables. Indeed, given the appropriate background assumptions, any theory can be made to be empirically equivalent or empirically non-equivalent with any other theory. Uh, I mean, so to just consider something like the, the young Earth creationist hypothesis, which claims that species do not evolve and that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, versus the modern evolutionary synthesis. These two theories could not be more different. Uh, and, and prima facie, they would seem to make very different predictions. The evolutionary synthesis predicts that we will find fossils in increasingly old rocks. Uh, we will find that they, they diverge to an, to an increasing extent from the morphology of modern organisms. Uh, the creationist theory would seem to be incompatible with that. But we need only add the assumption that God put the fossils there to test our faith or whatever, and we can make the theory give the right predictions. So, uh, strictly speaking, the theories. Uh, have basically the same observable consequences. Um, so, so this, so the point is that uh, the the observable consequences of a theory are going to depend on the the wider set of beliefs that uh, support that theory, and that makes it, you know, that means that we can't actually specify what it means to say that uh, we can't sort of specify that. You know, this is the set of observable consequences of a theory and it's the same as the set of observable consequences of this theory. It makes it very difficult to specify that two theories are in fact empirically equivalent. That would seem to be entirely context dependent. The second consequence is, suppose that we have two rival theories that, that, that do appear to be empirically equivalent given uh, fixed background assumptions. Let's say we take the background assumptions as fixed and we can um, show that two theories, T1 and T2, uh, are empirically equivalent given those assumptions. Well, even in this case, it may be that some other theory, T3, uh, when conjoined with T1, yields different predictions than when conjoined with T2. So some new theory that we come up with may make T1 uh, yield different predictions than T2. Or it may well be possible to capture T1 but not T2 within some broader accepted theory T4, and hence uh, the evidence for T4 becomes evidence for T1. Uh, so there may always be ways to distinguish between two theories that at first seem to be empirically equivalent. As a historical example of this um, latter case, uh, consider the special theory of relativity versus uh, the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction hypothesis. The contraction hypothesis attempted to retain the ether after the null results of uh, the Michelson and Morley experiment by, and I, I quote Okasha, 
uh, postulating systematic contractions in the measuring apparatus that would render undetectable the Earth's movement with respect to the ether. Uh, so special relativity and the Lorentz hypothesis were empirically equivalent. Uh, at the time, no empirical tests could have decided between them. However, only special relativity could be embedded in the general theory of relativity. And so the empirical evidence for the general theory became evidence uh, against the contraction hypothesis. So um, it seems then that the, that the idea of uh, empirical equivalence between two theories is um, it at least looks a bit more dodgy given confirmation holism. Now, Akasha notes that uh, one obvious way for the defender of the underdetermination argument to avoid this objection is to propose underdetermination of our global theory or underdetermination of our entire web of belief in Quine's, as, as Quine would say. Um, alternative webs of belief, perhaps very different from our web of belief, uh, make the same predictions about observable phenomena. And, you know, perhaps this is sort of the obvious way to run the underdetermination argument. I mean, after all, the sciences are heavily interconnected. A totally different theory of physics must entail a totally different theory uh, of astronomy, say, because astronomy depends on physics for, uh, for, for example, the interpretations of spectros spectroscopy. So a, a revolution in one science will generally produce a revolution in most of the others. What's underdetermined then is not a particular theory, but rather the entire scientific edifice as a whole. Uh, some wholly different worldview might be empirically equivalent to our worldview. But the problem now, of course, is that this uh, this argument has now become extremely abstract, um, and it's it's not clear that there are any such rival global theories. Um, I mean, as as we pointed out earlier, uh, it's it's not clear that there are. You know, you know, the, the, the challenge was initially. To, for the defender of the undetermination argument to actually present one of these empirically equivalent theories. Uh, if the undetermination argument is being run in terms of the entire web of belief, then the challenge becomes, well, let's see that uh, empirically equivalent but very different web of belief. And uh, it's, it looks, a, uh, you know, if that's what's required for the undetermination argument to work, that, that begins to look a lot less plausible. Um, I mean, uh, th there are uh, as well sort of uh, kind of arguments that some philosophers have made that in principle the idea that there could be radically different global uh, theories of the world um, has has problems. Um, Donald Davidson's work, particularly his article on the very idea of a conceptual scheme, uh, challenges the notion of uh, the, ver the very idea that there could be sort of radically different worldviews, radically different conceptual schemes. Um, but I, w I won't go into that. The, the point is just that you know, confirmation holism uh, seems to present a bit of a problem for the for the underdetermination argument. It, at least, um, you know, a defender of an underdetermination argument would would need to uh, think about how they might make it compatible with with confirmation holism. So, um, a final problem, and I think probably the one that's considered the most serious, is that it's not actually possible to uh, draw a distinction between theory and data, or so this argument claims. Uh, if there is no principal distinction between theory and data, then it makes no sense to claim that the data underdetermines the theory. So the idea here, the, the, the claim here, is that uh, observational evidence is theory-laden. In other words, our observations uh, can only be interpreted in light of our theories. So we can't, we can't draw a strict distinction between observations and theories. And then, of course, that, that makes this notion that uh, theories have specific sets of observational consequences um, rather questionable. So, I mean, first of all, let's, let's consider the common sense view of the relationship between theory and observation. We usually think it works something like this. You have a theory, you deduce some predictions from the theory, because, of course, the theory will make various claims about the world. And then you do an experiment, you make observations. If the observations conflict with the prediction, the theory is false. If they uh, are in, in, light, in, in line with the prediction, then uh, we at least have reason to accept the theory so far. Um, now, the idea is that observation is a neutral arbiter of theories. 
Uh, and of course, if observation is distinct from theories in this way, then uh, it, it can make sense to say that one theory entails the same observational claims as another. But arguably, this uh, view is just too naive. So here's a, an example from Paul Churchland that I think is a, a good way to, uh, to demonstrate the theory-ladenness of uh, observation. Churchland asks us to imagine a society whose basic conception of heat is essentially the, uh, the now discredited caloric theory. Caloric theory explains heat as being produced by a subtle fluid called caloric. Uh, all bodies contain caloric in differing amounts, uh, giving them different caloric pressures. And caloric always flows from high caloric pressure to low caloric pressure. So if two bodies with different caloric pressures are brought together, the caloric will flow from the higher pressure to the lower pressure until they equalise. Substances differ in their capacity for absorbing caloric. Some substances can absorb a great deal of caloric without the pressure rising too much. Uh, for instance, water. Water is a good absorber of, of caloric. Uh, other, other substances absorb only a small amount and have very large increases in caloric pressure. For instance, aluminium. Um, a tiny amount of caloric will, will make that uh, rise to a high pressure very quickly. So the people in this society don't talk about hot or cold or warm or anything like that. Rather, rather than saying that an object is hot or cold, they say that it has high caloric pressure or low caloric pressure. Now, to us, caloric is a postulate of a, a somewhat abstract scientific theory. Um, and we would probably say that caloric is, uh, is an unobservable postulate, a postulate of a, an abstract scientific theory. To the people in this society, caloric is just an obvious part of the, of the everyday world. Um, you know, the, the, the phrase, the stove has high caloric pressure, comes as naturally to them as the phrase, the stove is hot, comes to us. Furthermore, they would say that they can actually directly perceive caloric. Um, uh, so, for instance, if you place your hand on a stove with high caloric pressure, you just feel the caloric fluid flowing from the stove into your hand. Um, you know, that, that's just something that you can immediately sense. Okay, just imagine putting your hand on a hot stove. Of course, you feel the caloric moving into your hand. And, um, you know, it's, just, it's as simple as that. It's a direct perception. Uh, and, and in some circumstances, you can even see caloric with your eyes. Because when the caloric pressure of an object gets high enough, the caloric starts to glow uh, first red, then orange, then yellow, and so on as the pressure rises. So the observations that these people make, indeed the, the, very, the, the basic perceptual data that is available to these people, is laden with the theory of caloric. In some sense, of course, they experience exactly the same things that we do. Uh, when I put my hand on a hot stove, uh, and when somebody from this caloric society puts their hand on the hot stove, of course, the same physical process is occurring. But in an important sense, um, the observations are very different because of our different theoretical background. So the claim is that empirical data can't even be specified independently of theory. It makes no sense to say that one theory makes the same predictions as another because the very ability to interpret and understand empirical evidence depends on what theories you adopt. Uh, a, a real life scientific example is given by uh, Thomas Kuhn. Uh, I, I quote from his book, uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions. He says, During the 17th century, when their research was guided by one or another effluvium theory, electricians repeatedly saw chaff particles rebound from or fall off of the electrified bodies that had attracted them. Placed before the same apparatus, a modern observer would see electrostatic repulsion rather than mechanical or gravitational rebounding. But historically, electrostatic repulsion was not seen as such until Hulksby's large-scale apparatus had greatly magnified its effects. Um, theories provide us with the conceptual structure that allows us to uh, classify our immediate experiences of the world. Different theories will therefore lead to different observations. Furthermore, even where the same data are available, the salience of particular forms of data is heavily dependent on theory. 
Whether or not a particular observation refutes a theory may depend on other theories available at the time. A famous example of this is Brownian motion, discussed by Paul Feyerabend. Uh, I'm simplifying the uh, the history and physics of, of this example somewhat to make the, the, the philosophical point. Um, so the, the classical or phenomenological theory of heat postulated that uh, all mechanical interactions convert some energy into heat, and then the isolated system must eventually run down and come to rest, in the same way that if you put a load of ping-pong balls into a uh, box and excite them, the balls will eventually come to rest after having dissipated their energy in the form of heat. Uh, furthermore, matter is, is continuous, not built up from, from atoms. So the phenomenon of Brownian motion was used in the early 1900s to refute this theory. Uh, so in, in, 19, uh, in 1827, it was discovered by Robert Brown that if you suspend particles of pollen grains in water, these pollen grains will exhibit uh, a, um, a random jittery motion. Uh, he repeated this with inorganic particles and found that all small particles, whether living or not, displayed the same motion. So the phenomenon could not be biological. What's odd is that this motion seems to go on indefinitely. Uh, contrary to the classical theory, it, it never runs down. The, the, this jittering motion just continues seemingly forever. Now we can account for this by the modern kinetic theory of heat, which postulates that heat is uh, ultimately constituted by the kinetic energy of the molecules of a substance. Uh, the molecules of a substance are constantly bustling around, and the temperature of the substance is basically just a, a measure of the kinetic energy of this bustling. Now, Brownian motion arises because if we spend a, a, a very small particle in a liquid, the molecules of that liquid will hit the particle and, and shove it around, making it jiggle. The important thing to note here is that molecular energy cannot be dissipated into heat because the motion of the molecules is what constitutes the, the, the heat. No energy is lost in molecular interactions, so molecules can keep bouncing around forever. Uh, and, and this means that a particle suspended in those molecules can also keep bouncing around forever. Brownian motion is a motion that never runs down. Of course, Brownian motion does not violate the laws of thermodynamics as we understand them today because we can't harness this energy uh, and, and use it for, we can't sort of turn it into useful work. But it does falsify the classical theory. From the point of view of the classical theory, Brownian motion constitutes a kind of perpetual motion. Um, and there are various other respects in which it supports the modern theory. Uh, so raising the pressure of the liquid would uh, increase the number of molecules hitting the suspended particle, hence smoothing its motion. Raising the temperature of the liquid should increase the kinetic energy of the molecules, which in turn should make the jittery motion of the, par of the particle more violent. Uh, different substances are made of different molecules um, of, of differing sizes, so that should produce different types of Brownian motion. And all of these consequences can be uh, observed. Uh, for, now, the classical theory was not able to account for any of this, so you would expect that Brownian motion posed some serious problems. But in fact, Brownian motion was well known for about, for about 75 years before the classical theory was uh, rejected. And it was regarded as little more than a minor oddity. Um, I mean, for one thing, it could always be postulated that there is some other energy source to keep the suspended particles moving. So there was little need to be troubled by, by Brownian motion. Um, the facts of Brownian motion were well known, but the significance of them was, was hidden. Uh, the, the modern kinetic theory allowed us to see the salience of the available data. Uh, it allowed us to capture various phenomena that had originally just been noise or just puzzling curiosities under a single explanation. Uh, Brownian motion refuted the classical theory uh, only in the early 1900s when uh, Einstein used the kinetic theory to make predictions about the behaviour of the Brownian particles that uh, were subsequently confirmed in experiments by Jean Perrin. The important point is that had this behaviour been observed before, it, it would not have been of any relevance uh, in the absence of the kinetic theory. Uh, again, since Brownian motion was seen as a mere oddity, and the variations in it was, was just taken as sort of noise. Um, it, it, that, that, the, that such observations would really would have not have been of any relevance. Brownian motion only became evidence against the classical theory after the development of the, the atomic theory and the kinetic theory of heat. Um, 
So as, as I've said, um, I've simplified that case rather substantially, but it, it illustrates what, uh, as, as Farah Ben put it, he, uh, he says, there exist facts that cannot be unearthed except with the help of alternatives to the theory to be tested, and that become unavailable as soon as such alternatives are excluded. Theories give us a standard by which we evaluate our observations. Um, and the, there are other examples of, of the same kind of phenomenon, uh, so I don't really have time to explain this one in detail, but Samuel Schindler has studied the development of plate tectonics. Um, now, crucial evidence for plate tectonics is in the patterns of magnetic striping on the ocean floor. We have lines of positively and negatively magnetised rocks on the ocean floor. Now, today we account for this pattern by supposing that the seafloor spreads out as the plates of the Earth's crust diverge, combined with the phenomenon of magnetic field reversals. So at a particular time, the magnetic field is aligned in a particular direction. Um, new sea floor is created where the magnetic minerals become aligned with the magnetic field. And then, uh, after hundreds of millions of years, the magnetic field reverses. New sea floor is created with the magnetic minerals aligned in the opposite way. So we end up getting stripes of oppositely aligned uh, ma magnetic minerals. What's interesting is that before the acceptance of plate tectonics, both the positive and the negative magnetizations were known, but theorists interested in this phenomenon only attempted to explain the positive anomalies. Negative anomalies were treated as part of the norm and hence irrelevant, even though under, under the modern theory it's, it's very clear that, that the negative anomalies are just as important as, as the positive anomalies. Um, so that, that's just a, another example of how a fact which is extremely important um, in the, the modern theory and extremely important for refuting the earlier theories was was sort of was, was kind of hidden. The salience of it just was not known, given because of the theories that were available at the time. So uh, theories are very important in terms not just they don't. It's not just the observations are theory laden. Uh, theories are very important for interpreting uh, observations and interpreting the salience and importance of observations. Okay. Um, so theory, theory ladenness is a huge topic. Uh, there are many different versions of the hypothesis, and I would encourage you to uh, look it up yourself because I, I can't really do justice to it in this video. Um, uh, it is, uh, in one form or another, quite popular in, in contemporary philosophy of science. But if observations are theory laden, well, that means we can't draw a strict distinction between theory and observation. And that would undermine the claim that observations underdetermine theory. Um, you know, we can't sort of, we can't get a set of observations on the sort of one hand and then the theories on the other and sort of show that, you know, there's, there's just no way to separate them like that. So it becomes a bit more tricky to run this argument. So that's all for now. Uh, I hope this video is reasonably clear. A lot of the stuff we've covered today would really need a whole video to do properly. Uh, Non-empirical virtues, confirmation holism, theory ladenness. These are all uh, big topics, big difficult topics in the philosophy of science. But I hope that um, you've got the basic ideas and you can sort of see why these things might pose some problems for the underdetermination argument. I think this is probably the most the most complicated argument we'll be, we'll be looking at this series. Next video should be a little bit more straightforward. Um, so thanks for watching. Goodbye.